Your friends and our Lord, we're going to get into uh, our ongoing sermon series on Philippians. We're going to talk about that Euodia and Syntyche, as Mark read. Something was going on there with those two women of faith, and uh, we're going to talk about that. But I do want to emphasize, and I, I brought it in in the prayer a little bit, because I, we know God because he has revealed himself to us. He has not remained aloof. And he has not told us, well, you have to figure me out yourself because then we would be creating all sorts of things in order to somehow please God or to satisfy him or to put his anger at stay because he is powerful. Maybe some of you saw the sunrise this morning. Who can do that but a creator? Who can do that but God? And if we did not know his mercy in the cross, we would be afraid. That's what Jesus is talking about in the parable. There are several parables right in a row before his death on the cross. This is during Holy Week. He says, this is what the world sees, fear. And we act accordingly if we don't know his grace. But we do know his grace, and so we are bold and willing to do whatever is in our capability to bless him, including the gift of peace among each other. We're going to talk about that as Philippians 4 is introduced to us today. But I do have a couple signs for you. By the way, thanks to all of you for sending me signs upon signs upon signs. I'm just not going to use them all, but they're pretty good. And so I appreciate, um, I appreciate having you on my research staff. So anyway. <laughs> Safety notice, please do not board the bus once the driver has closed the bus doors. <clears throat> Uh, some things ought to be obvious. I think what they meant to say is please do not try to board the bus any longer after, but it doesn't look okay. Well, I get that. The doors are closed. I'm not going to do it. And this, is, uh, if this, is, this next sign is on the same order. It's a little bit different, but it's the same kind of concept. Anyone caught exiting through this door will be asked to leave. <laughs> I do like that one. Oh, I have to leave? The very thing I intended to do, oh my, how hard that is. So anyway, kind of, all right, we'll go on now. Gracious Living. I came up with that title because that's what we're reading in Philippians 4. Something's going on with, with those two women, Euodia and Syntyche. Why we don't use those names with our daughters, I think, is obvious to everybody. We're just not going to do that. Some of the other Bible names are great. Euodia and Syntyche, what was going on? So all the way through Philippians, Paul's talking about the grace of Christ, the power, the goodness of the cross. And then in Philippians 4, he's saying, but I know there are some things going on in the congregation that I want to talk about. I want to go through this with you. And so that's what we'll do today. We've got a lot of things to back this up. The word Paul uses, <clears throat> and Mark read uh, from Philippians, the uh, ESV, English Standard Version, uh, I entreat you, Odie, in Syntyche. I'm not sure about you. I have not used that word in a long time, entreat. I entreat you to do this. We just don't use that word. It is a legitimate translation of the Greek word there, but the Greek word is parakalo, and it's a very common uh, Greek word. You'll find it in a lot of places in the New Testament and in Greek literature outside of the scriptures. And it literally means to encourage, to admonish, to comfort. Now, two of those words have a positive look, and one has a negative appearance to us, admonish, but admonish is a good word. To admonish would imply a close relationship because I can trust your heart and you can trust mine, and my admonishment is not to put you down, is to encourage you or to comfort you in what you're facing. We're going to unpack that a little bit by looking at several portions of the Scripture, and I want to turn, first of all, to Acts 15. But before we go to Acts 15, I do want you to stay with me in Philippians. So let's go to Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. I just had it. And I want to read uh, part of um, 981, chapter 3. The very bottom of the page, 981, verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes this. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us 
And if we only had that verse standing apart, we'd say, that seems a little arrogant to me. Be like me. But this is the apostle who has confessed his own sins and in 1 Timothy says, I am the worst of all sinners, but he has learned from Christ Jesus how to live. And so these Philippian believers are very new in the faith. They knew Paul. He had been among them for a while. They knew him. They knew how he lived. So for him to say, follow my example, he's only saying, follow Jesus' example as I learned it from him. We're going to look at that now in a little bit more detail, but now continue the next page. And I'm going to be looking at uh, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, which is not unlike what Jesus said when he was on trial before Pontius Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. And once you get that, you can set aside those things that would bother us and control us, and we look again to Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, and that means uh, adelphoi in the Greek means fellow believers, beloved brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. By the way, I am encouraging, I am admonishing Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. I am glad we do not know the issue that they face, these two women of faith, as somehow there seems to be a separation. And a separation of the mind does not have to be a separation of the heart. A separation of the mind which would say, I think we ought to be doing this, and the other mind, I think we ought to be doing this, in the name of Jesus does not mean that the hearts have to be separated and say, well, now I'm angry at you and I want nothing to do with you. That's not where Christ would have us live. And as powerful as that is in a congregation, think again how powerfully that would be in relationship, in a marriage with moms, dads, children, brothers, sisters. We may have differing ideas, but not to have the heart separated. Now let's go to Acts chapter 15. Back up just a little bit. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And I'm going to be on page 924. In a general way, you may know that we have from Scripture three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. You may know that. If I were to give you a quiz, you'd say, I think there were three, and you'd be correct. Now, if I were to ask you who the main partner was for Paul on his mission trips, you would say, I th were there two? Yes, you'd be correct. On the first journey, it was Barnabas, and then the second and third, it was Silas. Why? I'll show you. Chapter 15, verse 36. And after some days, meaning days of resting, Paul said to Barnabas, these partners in the gospel, let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. In other words, back up to those cities and check on them. Oh, how can we help you? How can we encourage you? Uh, you're going through the faith. Have you suffered? What can we do to help you? Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. This is the author of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John Mark was a very young man, maybe not even 20, but he happened to be the cousin of Barnabas. That background is important to know. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. In the middle of the first missionary journey, John Mark, or Mark, said, I can't do this. This is too hard. I'm suffering, or I'm homesick, or this is not what I signed up for. Whatever it was, John Mark left them in the middle of the missionary journey. Okay? That's not right or wrong. Sometimes one knows, I, this is not for me. Uh, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do it some, somewhere else. So John Mark left them in the middle of the missionary journey, and now as they're starting the second missionary journey, Barnabas said, well, let's take John Mark with us. Paul said, yeah, I don't know about that. Isn't that a legitimate difference of opinion 
between two men of God whose minds are going different ways. I think that's not only legitimate, but completely understandable. Let's take John Mark. Yeah, but Brother Barnabas, I don't know. He left us. I don't think that's what we need in this missionary journey. Let's keep reading. 39, and there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, when we come across the phrase sharp disagreement, we have this in our human thinking. I'll bet they were yelling at each other. I don't know that they were yelling at each other. I think they were at an impasse. Do not Christian brothers and sisters have this throughout their lives? Where say, I think we need to do this. I think we need to do that. Well, if we can't agree on that, perhaps we ought to do each, but let's love each other. Let's commit ourselves to the way of Christ. So now with this disagreement, and the word sharp there, that, you, know, you don't know what that means. To me, it means they couldn't settle it. I got no problem with that, do you? Now we got two missionary teams instead of one. How is that a bad thing? And we have no indication anywhere else in Scripture that Paul and Barnabas were angry at each other. None. We have none. In fact, I'm going to show you a few things. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9. You're almost there. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. And that's on page 957. Let's begin at the bottom of page 956, verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Paul's the one who took the gospel to Corinth. They would not have known about the Lord Jesus Christ. They would not know salvation. They would not know eternal life in Christ. And thus, Paul had been there. Paul said, you know that I'm an apostle because I came to you. And you are proof of how God has chosen to work through me. Three, this is my defense to those who would examine me because Paul was not among the original 12 disciples. He came a half a generation later. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, which is Simon Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Paul links himself willingly with Barnabas as examples to them that they are sacrificing in the ministry for the sake of the people. Paul's right there and saying, Barnabas and I are together on this one. We are alone the bachelors who are serving God in the world and in this region. All right, now, let's go to Colossians 4. Uh, Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's on page 985. Page 985. At the conclusion of the letter, Paul is finishing things up. Verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. Jesus is a common name, Joshua, another man. Okay. Why am I saying, why am I pointing this all out? I'm pointing this all out because I want us to see that sharp disagreements are going to come within Christian community, be it large or small, even within families. There could be a disagreement of what one thinks and what the other thinks. Okay. But there needs to be no separation of the heart for each other under Christ's lordship. And somehow, we know that in Philippi, in the, among the believers, Euodia and Syntyche, whom Paul knew as fellow workers in the gospel, they were at odds with each other. And Paul uses the word parakolo, parakoleo in, in some verses, parakoleo, parakolo. I'm encouraging you. I'm comforting you. 
I'm admonishing you in the Lord. Not just to get along, but to be at peace with each other. Even if each is doing something different in the ministry, to be at peace with each other. Some of you have been here often enough when I do a baptism and I have the baptism and I ask the parents a question and then the sponsors are standing here and I ask the questions, the sponsors, something like this. Uh, you've been chosen by the parents of this child to fill a very important role. Your position as sponsor is not to be taken lightly. You have accepted this duty to see to it this child of God is raised firmly in the Christian faith. If there's ever cause for you either to encourage or to admonish his or her parents, you need to do so. And I wrote that myself. But anyway, I use the word admonish. And if some of you can't tell, you could tell over here. You couldn't tell over here. But every once in a while, a sponsor has this big grin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to admonish my brother or my sister. I'd love to admonish. But the word admonish is a strong encouragement. Because faith matters. And because following Jesus is real. And because the world would pull us apart. That's what the world does. What is the world to me? We sang that. That's one of my favorite hymns. What is the world to me? My Jesus is my treasure, my life, my health, my wealth. We have this. All right. Okay. Don't turn there. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Memorize that so that you know yourself better and better every day. The heart is is deceitful above all things. Not long ago, Jane and I were watching a movie. And in the movie, there's a conversation between two people. And one is just a little bit broken and is looking back at life, and the other says, you know what? You followed your heart. And that's always a good thing. <laughs> I just went, whoa! How can you... But the world would believe that. If I follow my heart, that's not good. If I, follow, if I follow my heart under Christ's lordship and leading and teaching and direction and sacrifice and the fellowship of the community of saints, that might be a good thing. But the ways of our nature are to say, I'm going to follow my heart, therefore I'm right. Well, you might not be. I'm going to do it because I want to. And you're going to defend yourself with that? I'm not accusing anybody here, but you know how that works. It's what I want to do. I'm going to do it. Okay. Uh, how does that align with Christ? How does that align with things of mercy and kindness and sacrifice and renewal and repentance? And how does that align with any of those things? Back to Philippians. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Just back up a little bit from where you are. Page 980. Shall I look to my own heart? Better not. Shall I look to Christ and his heart? For me and for the world? Yes. Now, this letter was written to be read from beginning to end. I think we understand that. We've, now, we've given it eight weeks. That's a little bit unnatural, but that's how we unpacked it. So the people in Philippi, the believers in Jesus in Philippi, are receiving this whole letter at one time. Verse 1. So if there is any encouragement, there's that theme again, in Christ, any comfort, there's that theme again, from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is our call. For a Christ 
Christ-centered life. A Christ-centered marriage, family, congregation. Made up of countless people with individual personalities and individual histories and who each has a heart that's deceitful above all things. How is that going to work? By holding Christ first. Who is he? He's the one who showed me about love. He is the one who has shown me the thing, the beauty of sacrifice. He is the one who has paid for my sins and freed me from darkness. Now, I'm drawn back to that by my nature, but daily I repent. Daily I'm renewed in baptism. Daily I'm strengthened and comforted so that I can be comforted by another saying, you know what? You might want to work on that because we both love Christ. And I'm not sure that way is honoring him. Whatever that way is, I'm glad we don't know what Euodia and Syntyche were facing. I'm glad we don't have it because then we would focus on that perhaps more than we ought to. But to see all things in our Christian living that are at the core of maybe separating in things of the world and things of pride or in things of unwillingness to conform to another's need or support another, whatever that is. And Philippians 2 takes us back to Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he was God, did not consider that something to be held on to, but made himself nothing. Taking upon himself the nature of a servant, and being found in human likeness, the baby, flesh, skin, pain, weakness, death. There's the cross. And all of it connects us with daily living. How now shall I live? How now can I be most comforted by having Christ primary, first at the center of my life, for he is Lord and Savior.